Hello everybody, this is Derek Adams from Red Bluff, California, and today we're going to talk about mummies, a look at paleodermatology. It's the first of two lectures I'm giving today. The next one is on the American Sideshow and genodermatosis, and it is called Step Right Up, so I hope you stick around for that one as well. So let's talk about mummies. And of course, no conflicts of interest, unlike Chuck Norris the attorney that represents injured people. Paleodermatology is a subset of paleopathology, and that paleopathology literally means just ancient suffering. And it's the study of disease of ancient remains, or you could really say more broadly, remains outside of the scope of modern history. The term can be applied to ancient Egyptian mummies or a 500-year-old Renaissance body, or even just a body pulled out of an old Boot Hill Cemetery from the 1800s. And paleodermatology is, you know, self-explanatory. There's an old story that the famous dermatologist Albert Kligman once said that anything done by a dermatologist before the advent of hydrocortisone should be considered paleodermatology. Which brings us to why this stuff even matters in the first place, other than the fact it's just inherently fascinating. I think everybody would agree to that. But it matters because mummies are us and we are them and the maladies that they suffer prove this because we suffer from many of the same things today. We can look at how industrialization has affected human health. For instance, we hear the heart disease and cancer are afflictions due to modernization. But we're going to see them on the coming mummies here. We'll see that they existed in the ancients as well. So studying mummies gives us a good starting point for many diseases, or at least it pushes the timeline back and data points for epidemiologists to follow. We can also study the history of outbreaks, such as uh, schistosomiasis, malaria, and insect vector diseases. And also, too, there's a raging debate about whether cancer and heart disease really are modern diseases, and are they triggered by our growing exposure to toxins and hormones and sugary processed foods, or is it something that has always been with us and maybe always will? And these ideas have gained a lot of traction recently over the last several years. We've all seen you know, headlines that you know, sugar causes cancer or power lines causes cancer, you know, insert whatever here causes cancer or heart disease. But we're going to see a lot of this, a lot of these diseases have been with us since ancient times. When we talk about the way individuals are mummified, it can be either an accidental, an intentional, or an artificial process. And an accidental mummification is somebody getting caught, you know, in an ice storm and they freeze to death or they fall into a, a bog in Europe. Intentional is where people take advantage of the natural circumstances, like you would take your loved one up high into the Andes Mountains and let them pretty much be uh, flash frozen uh, and, and desiccated since those are high, you know, mountainous deserts. Also, artificial embalming is the one we're most familiar with, and that has to do with embalming fluid and chemicals, or sometimes taking the uh, skin and the bones off of a corpse and then tanning them over a fire, and then you know reconstructing the being, and then uh, then interning them at that point. Uh, in the case of Egypt, it was most likely the arid climate and not really the ritual embalming process that preserved all these bodies. In fact, the oldest known Egyptian mummy, whose name is Ginger is from uh, about 3500 BC and was not embalmed at all. And we're going to see examples of each as we go through. There's another type of mummification that's fascinating, but we're not going to talk about it because there's not any derm-related studies with it, but it's called a uh, adipocere, or it's when the body pretty much saponifies and it turns into grave wax or corpse butter, it's sometimes called. But you can Google search that. It's pretty interesting. But usually, no matter how the mummification was achieved, the skin tends to be shrunken, deeply pigmented, and is very brittle on macroscopic examination. Oh, and here we actually have a picture of Ginger, who's the oldest Egyptian mummy. And Ginger is a man. He has red hair, and that's how he got that nickname. He was about 21 years old when he died. And he's a good example of intentional mummification. There were no chemicals used with ginger here. His body was placed in a shallow grave in direct contact with the dry hot sands of Egypt which just sucked all the water out of his body and mummified him. Now the oldest mummies in the world come from Chile and the uh, Chinchuro black mummies are what they're known by. These are artificial mummies that date back to around 5000 BC which is 2000 years older than the Egyptian mummies. And it's considered an example of artificial mummification, even though there are no chemicals used. Uh, 
because these bodies were disassembled and the skin and bones were heated over the fire, then the bodies were reassembled and then packed in clay. Now the oldest naturally mummified corpse recovered from Peru, or really anywhere, is from the Atacama Desert, which dates to around 7000 BCE. Inuit mummies from Greenland were essentially freeze-dried so well that their dermatoglyphs are retained, and EM studies show that these mummies have collagen that's indistinguishable from that of living human skin today. But there are mummies all over the world. They're the so-called salt men of Iran. They're ancient Chinese mummies, Native American, Mexican, South Pacific. Really every continent but Antarctica has a history of mummification. The Hong and the Ming dynasty have even these things called the wet mummies because they're embalmed in mercury. And if there's a way to preserve human flesh, people did it somewhere at some point in time. Sir Mark Armand Rufer is considered the pioneer of paleopathology. He was originally working in England, and he was working on diphtheria when he became infected with the disease and suffered some kind of severe paralytic sequelae that compelled him to resign, and he took up a post in Egypt where he became interested in paleopathology. And he made the first important observations in, and invented a softening fluid for the rehydration of the brittle mummy tissue before they could be processed for microtome sectioning. Rufer published a book called Paleopathology of Egypt, and there's probably not a paper in existence on paleohistology that appears without a reference to Rufer's pioneer work. But for a more modern source, uh, I recommend the article by Lowenstein that was published in 2004 if you're interested on a good jumping off point to look at these issues further. This is a section of a few thousand year old mummy from ancient Egypt. And this is from the collection of Dr. Darius Merrigan, who's a dramatopathologist in Monroe, Michigan, with Pincus Laboratories. And he told me that this was a gift from an Egyptian dermatologist to his father quite some time ago. But using roofer's rehydration methods, which have been refined since then, it needs to, to sit in a solution for one to four days before it's subjected to the microtome. But you can see there's stratum corneum, you can see the keratinocytes, you can see some melanin hyperpigmentation there at the basal layer. Looks like the uh, papillary dermis has been lost to the sands of time, but the reticular dermis is quite well preserved. And although I don't have any photos to share with you, but it's been shown that electron microscopy in mummified skin, you can see these nuclei that have this dense chromatin, and you can see tonofilaments, you can see the desmosomes. Uh, melanocytes in longer Han cells have not been seen, to my knowledge yet, that I could find in the literature, but elastic fibers are usually pretty well preserved in both their amorphic and their fibrillar form. And one thing I was shocked at going through the literature is that there are so few studies actually done on the skin of mummies outside of just gross macroscopic observations. And I've read one estimate where they're, they're literally saying there may be 70 million plus mummies in Egypt alone that have yet to be discovered based off you know population analysis at the time. So. In addition to that and all that stacked in warehouses around the world that haven't been studied, this there should be a lot of information coming out in the future regarding mummified skin. In 2016, Jones et al. published a report where they conclusively identified over 230 proteins present in a very small subset of skin and tissue that were taken from three Egyptian mummies of the first intermediate period, which was about 4,000 years ago. These mummies were excavated in 1911 and in pretty poor shape, evidently, so the curators didn't mind the researchers doing this to them. But the, this woman that you see here is a Kepeset, I believe is the way it's pronounced, and what you're about to see are the samples that were taken from a small punch biopsy of her hand. You can see the most abundant protein observed were these various isoforms of collagen, which collagen is very abundant in ancient tissue because, you know, it's essentially leather. Right, But the prevailing hypothesis on why it lasts so long is that there are the, these intrinsic structural features like the cross-linking of hydroxyproline residues that makes them more resistant to degradation and hence lasting longer. And for those of you that like scanning electron microscopy up there in the left-hand corner, sample A is the collagen from Kepeset's hand, and the other three are from the other mummies that we're not talking about right now. And from the hand of Kepeset, you had this soup of inflammatory markers that were discovered. And I included this because this is one of the only studies, in fact, the only study I could find where uh, inflammatory markers were tested for and detected in mummies.
but as I said earlier, there's literally warehouses yet to be examined full of mummies. I picture it like the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark when they're rolling the credits, and there's just like endless crates of artifacts probably to be forgotten and miscatalogued and you know never studied. But the authors here guess that she suffered from bacterial pulmonary pneumonia based upon the, the pattern and the ratios they saw these inflammatory markers here. When you look at the work of paleopathology, chronic infections and orthopedic injuries are by far and away the most common pathologies described. A derm doesn't even really rank toward the top. But I put together some of the more interesting ones I could find. And as far as we're aware, there are no reports of eczema or psoriasis or really any inflammatory conditions, which makes the hand of Kepeset so interesting, in my opinion. There is one report from 1904 that tentatively diagnosed eczema from the gross appearance of a American or a Southwest American mummy. I pulled this article and read it, and all it mentions is that the infant had some scale on its head, but this often gets repeated throughout all the different paleopathology, paleoderm literature. So I wouldn't make a diagnosis of, of eczema based off that. As you and I know, that could be many things. Also, in reality, the claims of SCCs and dramatic fibromas are a little dubious too. The authors, in my opinion, make some pretty adventurous assumptions at times. And then there's a phenomenon of, of pseudopathology that trick researchers and, you know, where we think of a rodent ulcer as being a basal cell, you know, a rodent ulcer could be just truly a rodent ulcer, you know, a rat gnawing at a skull. Um, there's also when the mummies are being prepared, you know, the ropes choking off certain areas of the skin, just the change of the general morphology and such. And sometimes the coffins will do strange things uh, to the skin as well. There's plenty of skeletal evidence also of nutritional disorders that I didn't put on this list, like scurvy and hypervitaminosis that would have cutaneous findings, but either uh, they didn't have any skin to examine or they just chose not to examine it or, or publish it for whatever reason. Now we're going to go around the world and examine some individual mummies and some of the skin findings that they exhibit. Our first person we're going to meet is Pharaoh Ramses V. This is not the Ramses of the Old Testament and Moses. That is believed to have been uh, Pharaoh's Ramses II. But uh, Ramses V here is a good example of how dermatologists can play a role in uh, pathology, especially paleopathology. Uh, he was excavated in 1898, and at the time people speculated that the extensive blackheads across his temples and his forehead were because he didn't wash or he was wearing heavy you know, ceremonial makeup. And it was a dermatologist that pointed out that it was probably due to extensive solar degeneration like a, you know, a Favre Rocca show type phenomenon rather than anything that had to do with him uh, you know, socially, ritually wearing makeup. And it's believed that Ramses V is history's first known casualty to smallpox. He died in 1157 BCE. That's a picture of his tomb there. But one thing I learned during this, uh, putting together this talk, is that the ancestral form of smallpox that our most immediate ancestors were exposed to probably arose around the 1600s, whereas the one that killed Ramses, if it indeed was due to smallpox, was from a virus lineage that was no longer circulating at the point of the, to the late 1970s when smallpox was actually eradicated. And this is an interesting article from the World Health Organization from 1980 that describes the examination of the mummy. President Anwar al-Sadat was reluctant to permit them to actually cut a piece of skin that contained some of the possible variola blisters. So instead, it says, quote, we collected tiny pieces of skin on the shroud. On examining the front of the mummy from the waist up, we saw a rash of yellowish blisters or pustules, each one between one and five millimeters in diameter. The rash is most striking over the lower face, neck, shoulders, and is also visible on the arms, but there's no rash on the chest and upper part of the abdomen. Earlier photographs published by G. Elliott Smith show the rash also prominent on the lower part of the abdomen and the scrotum, uh, in, in quote. These researchers could not see the palms and the soles, and despite the limited areas that were accessible for inspection, they mentioned the rash is quite striking and quite similar to smallpox. They also mentioned, too, that their immunologic and virologic studies didn't yield the hope for evidence of variola virus, but then again, they were just examining some of the shroud, and they didn't actually have access to skin samples off Ramses. It was terrifying to think what would happen if 
mummies were exhumed and, and they did have viable variola virus, especially when you look at all the melting permafrost in, in the Arctic. Uh, there will be a lot of mummies exposed in the coming decades, I'm sure, there. And what do they have that, that's still lurking in the ice? But experimentally, scabs have remained viable up to 13 years. And there are well-published examples in England. Like, for instance, Dorset, England, there was a person that died of smallpox. And 30 years later, they dug them up. And then the whole village was afflicted with smallpox after that. But I found several studies on mummies that were 100 and 500 years old, and neither of those actually showed any non-viable virus. So it's still a big uh, question kind of hanging over the head of paleopathology at this point. Here are two skeletons from the dynastic period of Egypt that are believed to show the first evidence of basal cell nevus syndrome. You can see the cyst in the jaw there on the top left. You can see the bifid ribs beneath, and you can see the shortening of the fourth metacarpal there in the hand and not pictured there's some incomplete fusion of the sacrum as well as some pretty severe asymmetry of the uh, occipital bones as well and this case was published in 1975-76 and i'm not sure what happened to these skeletons and it doesn't mention whether or not any skin was available for examination venous insufficiency was also described by the ancients in the ebers papyrus or ebers papyrus that dates to about 1500 bce and uh, there's been an ulcer on an Egyptian mummy that dated from around 1300 BCE that was thought to be secondary to venous hypertension. And the ulcer was just above the lateral malleolus, and the histology showed hemosiderin deposition around the blood vessels. And arteries in the Egyptian mummies can be pretty well preserved, and they can be examined histologically really without much difficulty at all. This mummy pictured here doesn't have anything to do with venous insufficiency, but wanted to show you this is a, a petite royal Egyptian princess who had very severe coronary artery disease. In fact, the author states she would have needed a four-way bypass surgery today. It's a random sample of tissue taken from the heel of an Egyptian mummy and had a well-circumscribed dermal mass composed of world dark staining material. Uh, Masson's trichome stain showed a small amount of fibrous tissue within the lesion and the iron stain was notably positive. So the author here made a tentative diagnosis of a probable histiocytoma. I want to correct an error I made on the basal cell Neva syndrome cases. Those were actually published in the early 1900s. I had said that it was published in 1976. This case was published in 1976, so I excuse, please excuse me on the error there. But there's this case here shows there's understandably a lot of errors and there's a lot of room for discussion in paleodermatology. This was uh, from a mummy who died in about 800 BCE and the skin was quite well preserved and it had these inguinal subcorneal vesicles, the type seen in subcorneal pustular dermatosis. So the author concluded that it was Sneedon-Wilkinson's disease, which wasn't described until 1956. And it's hard to know why the authors jumped right to that diagnosis and you could easily have been in patigo or pemphigus foliaceus or you know a lot of other things as we know there's some pitfalls in making that diagnosis believe it or not mummies are quite common in italy and there's for instance there's over 300 bodies of preserved saints just alone in italy but the italian mummies are scattered all over the italian territory and they range mostly from the medieval period through the Renaissance up to more recent times. This is the Basilica of San Francisco in Tuscany. And when they were doing some remodeling on the, on the floors, they found nine wooden coffins that had nine well-preserved natural mummies that dated back to the 16th century. This is Maria of Aragon, who was a noblewoman during the Italian Renaissance and was a friend of Michelangelo's. Maria's skin was able to tell researchers a few things. The first of which is that on her left arm, she had an oval 15 by 10 millimeter cutaneous ulcer that was covered in a linen dressing with ivy leaves. And it uh, stained with anti human antitrepanomal palladium antibody. And of course it was diagnosed as third stage syphilis. She was also noted to have a pedunculated skin tumor affecting the right paravulvar region. And light microscopy of this, which I don't actually have a picture of, showed an exophytic skin lesion, had some thickened epidermis, and had some dilated vessels, of course, there in, in the collagen. And DNA studies confirmed the presence of HPV type 18, which 
of course, means this poor woman had both genital warts and syphilis. Now we're going to meet Ferdinand Orsini, Duca Gravina, who evidently enjoyed the southern Italian son a little too much. He passed away in 1549, and his mummy had a wide erosion of the upper orbital margin, as you can see there, probably a little onto the glabella as well. But anyways, right nasal and retroorbital bones were destroyed as well. The histology showed, quote, a solid neoplasm with cords of spindle-shaped cells destroying compact and spongy bone and forming osseous lacunae with no bone reaction, end quote. So the authors declared this was a uh, probably a skin epithelioma, probably a basal cell carcinoma, and they were able to get it to stain very strongly with pan, excuse me, pancytokeratin. And you can certainly buy the idea that it was a BCC looking at the histology that they were able to lift off the skin there. And overall, when it comes to neoplasms in ancient skin, there really aren't many described. And if we take the population of the known mummies and the, the probably studied mummies, <laughs> mummies, the incident is markedly lower than our population today. And a common argument is you know, well, people didn't live long enough to get skin cancer. But studies are showing consistently that about 40% of ancient populations lived to be at least 40 years old. And of course, they had a very high infant mortality rate, though. And as we've seen, skin is quite well preserved, so I'm not real sure why there's such a, a lack of, of uh, skin neoplasms in mummies. It could just be a matter of sample size at this point. Here's another example of where the osseous record might imply some cutaneous findings. These bones are from the Harari culture at about 1000 AD in what is now modern day Peru. And the authors felt like the enormous thickening diaphyses that you see here represented pachydermal periostosis due to the pattern. Uh, however, there was no soft tissue or again, there's no skin to actually examine here. And of course, it's no surprise that mitts have been found everywhere mummies are found. In fact, the oldest intact head louse was actually found, excuse me, a, a knit was actually found on the hair from an archaeological site that was in northeastern Brazil and dates back to about 8,000 BCE, so a 10,000 year old knit there. Uh, some North American mummies show that 44% of the population was actually affected. And again, that should come as no surprise, but hunter gatherer societies and the nomadic people usually had lower rates of infections. And of course, knit combs are not at all an uncommon finding in many archaeological sites. And this is a mummy from China that was discovered in 1980 when some uh, film crew was making a show about the Silk Road. They actually found this mummy buried about three feet underground and she was preserved because of the dry climate. And she was infested with head lice as many of the mummies around her were. In fact, some of the mummies in her immediate vicinity had nits that were deposited as far as 20 centimeters from their scalps that indicate a pretty long standing infection. Archaeologists also find nits in coprolites, you know, aka human droppings, in mummies from Greenland. And they speculate that they either use the lice as a food source or they ate them in an attempt to get rid of them, uh, you know, eradicate the infestation from, from everybody. And that is taking one for the team, in my opinion. So we'd all guess that most mummies were infested with nits. It's probably no big surprise. But what about melanoma? And there's a very often cited article that appeared in the journal Cancer from 1966, and it's pretty frequently cited today, that states that there are nine Incan mummies that exhibit features of metastatic melanoma. And the primary evidence that they cite in this article is what they call diffuse metastasis to bones, particularly of the skull and of the extremities. And they do have some secondary evidence, but the secondary evidence is listed as, quote, round melanotic masses seeming to be common with melanoma satellites. And in the more recent decades, authors have cast a lot of skepticism on this article from 1966. Uh, Lowenstein, whose article I told you about at the beginning of this talk, was skeptical of the diagnosis because there wasn't any histologic testing, which seems quite reasonable. And then Rothschild and Martin in 2006 rejected the diagnosis of melanoma and attributed the cited osseous lesions more to damage that occurred post-mortem from various fungal infections. So in light of this, it's worth mentioning that at this point, we don't have any solid evidence of melanoma existing in any mummies from anywhere in the world.
but it's also worth remembering that, as we pointed out in earlier slides, the melanocytes don't survive the aging process well. So at this point, really, who knows? Changing gears a little bit here, we have a skull from the Curabaya culture of southern Peru of about 1000 AD, and it's believed to represent uh, mucocutaneous leishmaniasis having destroyed the front of the maxillary bones there. And this individual was noted to have a significant head lice infestation as well. And this individual here is known as Toland Man. He is about 2300 years old. He's from the Iron Age and he was pulled from a bog in Denmark in 1950. And no one knows how these numerous mummies ended up in the various bogs around northern Europe, but they usually have the presence of really horrific wounds like slashed throats, sometimes their nipples have been cut off, and it suggests that these bodies may have been put in there for sacrificial reasons or to execute people or as punishment for various crimes. But bog bodies often have this very leathery, dark brown skin, and some of them have been preserved in such a fashion that their hair was dyed red after death by the sphagnum moss. A lot of time these bog bodies are discovered by people that are cutting peat in order to burn for fuel. And it turns out that these cool waterlogged conditions of northern Europe, what we kind of call a wetland here, they create these low oxygen environments that have a really high acidity level. And, uh, and this is primarily from sphagnum moss. And the sphagnum also bonds with the nitrogen, which the bacteria need to survive. So it takes the nitrogen out of the equation and it helps prevent the spread and the degradation that the microorganisms would cause. And although the sphagnum does a great job preserving the skin, it actually steals calcium away from the bone. So it's not too great for the skeletons. So oftentimes these bog bodies are found with very soft, really flimsy bones that are about as sturdy as cardboard and they get distorted by the heavy peat layer on top of them. So oftentimes they're contorted in these very strange positions. But I've got to say their nails look great. They actually look better than my nails. And you know, this guy's 2,300 years old. And this here is Gerbal Man from about 300 BCE from a bog in Denmark. And his fingers were so perfectly preserved that they could actually take his fingerprint like they do for forensics. And he was a ritual sacrifice victim. He had his throat slit and analysis of his stomach showed that he had eaten this hallucinogenic fungus in the form of a soup. And they speculate that maybe that was to induce a trance-like state in the ritual that included his sacrifice. Here's an example of one of two bog bodies that were found in Ireland in 2003. And they date from around 175 to 400 BCE. And both of these bodies, I only have one picture here, but they've been subjected to some pretty spectacular mutilations, and one of which was having their nipples cut off. And the researchers felt that this is probably representative of an old Celtic king who had failed in their duties, because in Ireland, the king was such a pivotal member of society, so when things went wrong, he would pay the price because he was ceremonially... Um, you know, married to the land, and he had this ceremonial marriage in kingship with the goddess who represented fertility and land. And the authors say that the king was there to ensure milk and cereal for his people. And there's an old story that St. Patrick would report on the Irish people sucking on the king's nipples as a rite of fealty. So lacerated nipples meant uh, no crown either here or in the afterlife. In 1991, a German hiker was in the Utstall Alps on the border between Italy and Austria, and he discovered a body emerging from a glacier. And scientists eventually named him Utzi, or Otzi, the Tyrolean Iceman. And he was a mummy that's been preserved in this glacier since about 3000 BCE, which puts him there with the oldest of Egyptian mummies, but still quite young compared to the Peruvian mummies. Otzi had a few cutaneous abnormalities that were found, including the presence of three bows lines on his remaining fingernails, and he had a traumatic wound to his right hand, which was thought to have occurred a few days before his death. He also had an arrowhead stuck in his back shoulder, which lead scientists to believe that he was possibly uh, hunted down and then bled out to death, and then uh, was pretty much uh, exposed in the, in the icy Alps there, and he freeze-dried which led to this exceptional state of preservation. And then after he was flash frozen, a short time later, a glacier covered the area and buried his body for five millennia. So it was like a five millennia old time capsule.
So there aren't any major pathological cutaneous findings on Otzi. For instance, scientists noted that his few remaining scalp hairs provide early archaeological evidence of hair cutting, or they say the earliest archaeological evidence of hair cutting, which I don't know if that's true or not. Otzi's tattoos have been a subject of a lot of fascination since then. He has 61 different tattoos that are organized into 19 different groups. And although ultimately no one really knows, it's believed that these tattoos serve some type of therapeutic or diagnostic purpose for the Iceman because the groupings of these tattoos tend to cluster around the lower back and joints that archaeologists have found that he had some pretty severe arthrosis in. There was a strange tattoo over his chest that didn't correlate with any underlying arthrosis, but it's not hard to imagine he could have suffered from some ailment of that gave him chest pain, maybe like angina, for instance, that that, that tissue just wasn't well preserved and, and that clue has been lost to time. There's also a prevailing theory that these tattoos, since they many of them are located over acupuncture points, that this was representative of a primitive form of acupuncture. And, if that's the case, it speaks to really how ancient the knowledge of acupuncture could be, because traditionally it's associated with traditional Chinese medicine, but this could be evidence that it's been around way before then. And there for a while, the so-called mark of Otzi became popular for people to get on their back, and Otzi's even been tattooed on Brad Pitt's arm. And as I mentioned before, Otzi had three bows lines on his remaining nails, and scientists believe they correlate to roughly 16, 13, and 18 weeks before his death. He probably suffered from some type of serious, serious illness. And I haven't been able to find any significant research on m the nails of mummies, but I did find a report where measles lines that were secondary to arsenic poisoning had been reported. Usually archaeologists use nail examination more to offer information and, and to speculate on the possible vocation of the person that they had, although I wonder how scientifically valid that could really be. This is an archaeological site of ancient Egypt called Deir el Medina, and it was a workman's village where people of all walks of life lived as they labored on the pyramids. And they're finding that Egyptians, that previ previously not many tattoos were reported in ancient Egyptians, but evidently they were hiding in plain sight this entire time, but you need infrared technology to see them. And strangely enough, they found that usually it was the women that were tattooed more often. So scientists are using the study of these uh, tattoos on women to better understand the women's experiences in the village. And prior to this study in 2016, there were only three cases of known mummies that were tattooed from ancient Egypt, at least from the days of the pharaohs. So it's curious that these tattoos, uh, that these mummies have, you know, in some cases up to 30 tattoos, and they have just been, again, hiding in plain sight all this time. A lot of these tattoos suggest that these women served in various capacities as priestesses and healers. You know, they have uh, tattoos of hieroglyphics on their neck or the Egyptian eye or the Egyptian symbol for protection. One woman had a tattoo of a seated baboon on each side of her neck. And it's really hard to know what to make of this, and you could you could think that, oh, how come we can't see the tattoos in these Egyptian mummies, but we can see them in all the other mummies from all over the world? And you wonder if they were visible back then, or maybe these were secret tattoos that would only could be exposed looking at them in, under a certain method within the confines and secrecy of a temple at the time, and really, who knows? So now, we're going to take a look at our mummery summary. First of all, we've shown that skin can be preserved in a myriad of different ways. And structures that are keratin-based or collagen-based tend to be quite remarkably well-preserved. And ancient skin remains viable for study today by numerous modalities. And there happens to be a, a real lack of skin neoplasms found in the record. But hopefully this is just from there being such a small sample size. As, as I said earlier, it's estimated that in Egypt alone there may be up to 70 million more mummies. And Again, at one time, scientists didn't believe that Egyptians tattooed themselves. Now we're saying this is not the case. They may find a tremendous amount of uh, you know, epithelial and neoplasms going forward. And there is a lack of inflammatory conditions in the mummy record. If you remember, the hand of Kepeset was the only 
uh, one I could find that actually had any documented evidence of an inflammatory condition. And it was believed that she was expressing skin markers of her bacterial pneumonia uh, upon that biopsy. And as no surprise here, parasitic and infectious diseases abound in the ancient world. And finally, there is no hard evidence that any of these Incan mummies ever had melanoma, and hopefully this falsehood uh, will come to an end and quit being repeated over and over in the literature. So we come to the end of our journey today on mummies, and here are the references if you care to look for anything. Again, the Lowenstein article from 2004 is a good jumping off point if this topic interests you. I also put my email address on here, and I'd like to hear from any of you and get some feedback. Doing these virtual conferences like this, it's I can't read the look of disdain or approval in anybody's face. So if anybody has any thoughts or concerns or wants to talk to me more about skin diseases in mummy, please hit me up. Thanks for listening.